Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Investor Financing Podcast. And do we have a great show today? We're going to talk about stacking Benjamins. And that's what we need to do in recessionary times. We need to stack Benjamins. Everybody's fearing the market right now. And I think uh, there's, there's a certain percentage of people that aren't. And those are the people that are prepared. that are listening to diff different podcasts like our guests today where they, they make money fun and they talk about different topics. Uh, please welcome Joe Saul Cihai to the show. Nice job. You okay. got it right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've screwed up so many names. <laughs> Joe's got a fantastic background. We, we usually have like some stuffy real estate people on the show, and it's good to get some diversity on the Investor Finance Podcast because I think it's, it's important to talk all things money because we need to have different stacks of Benjamins all over. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to make way, it fun. Bo, by yeah. the way, Bo, you know, it's funny that I'm a middle-aged white guy. And when people say they bring me on for diversity, that doesn't, that doesn't happen very often. I just want to point out the obvious. So thank you that I get to be the diverse guy in the room for one time in my entire career. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, we both have the bald heads, you know, I got we a do. little, I got a little less gray, um, but it's starting to come in the beard. Yeah. When you're bald, you have to have facial hair. Everybody <laughs> says it like, you know, if I started going bald at an early age. <laughs> like, I was like, okay, I had the goatee going. I'm like, I got to I got the Vin Diesel maybe going a little bit. But when you go bald at an early age, it's like, it sucks, man. It sucks. But I just embraced it. I was like, all right, just shave the head. And uh, it was so liberating. And now it's like, I couldn't imagine having hair anymore. So, I mean, yeah. I started going bald very, very young. <laughs> it was like, you know, like, what do you do? You can like, they can nowadays they can take hair from your butt and put it on top of your head like or or the back of your head but i mean it, it actually looks natural but i i've been bald for so long i wouldn't do that i thought about that i just went to see top gun and uh, a friend of mine who's a comedian in atlanta uh paul ollinger is his name paul wrote a whole th write up about top gun have you seen it by the way no oh it's so good it's so the new top gun so amazing but <laughs> but you know tom cruise the first thing that you don't notice that paul notices because he's a comedian is just how great his hair guy must be because there's <laughs> no way a dude his age has that full mane of hair whatever that he just kind of flicks back the way that he does but i'm with you hey man own the ball let's yeah. own it yeah, yeah. And that's the whole thing. You got to be confident, you know, uh, as a person and you have to be confident in money management and, and financial planning and all that good stuff. You got to be confident in this world. And if you're not, you're going to get taken advantage of. But Joe is a former financial advisor, like 16 years. He re represented American Express, Ameriprise in the media. He was the money man at Detroit Television, WXYZ. TV appearing twice weekly. He, he appeared in Bride, Best Life, Child Magazines, Los, Los Angeles Times. He's been in like 300 publications. He's all over the place. Okay. He, he has a very award winning podcast. They get hundreds and hundreds of thousands of downloads per month. And he's um, co author or, or the author. He's the author and he has a co author yes. of Stacked, Your Super Serious Guide to mo uh, Modern Money Management. Oh, that's awesome. And you're doing a tour. You're going to go into 40 cities throughout the nation. And uh, I, saw, I saw a lot where at Barnes and Nobles and all over. So that's going to be a fun yeah. thing to do. All right. Are you going to run, run an RV and with like the book cover on the outside? I got to tell you, we're actually we're actually close to the end. In two weeks, we'll be done. So when this comes out, we, you, you might have missed me, but we'll catch you next time. Yeah. But we um, but I've been on every airplane, I feel like, on Earth. And um, yeah, rental uh, one way rental cars, uh, hotel rooms. My Marriott points, my IG, uh, IHG reward point systems going crazy. But um, yeah, yeah. So, so what can you give us a little like high level of what's stacked is what your book's about? Yeah, like you, I get to interview a lot of really cool people about good money topics. And what the world doesn't need is just another damn book, right? We have so many books. We got great podcasts like yours. We've got all of the we got YouTube videos. We got all this great stuff. But the frustrating thing for me, and this is where this book sits firmly, is I read a report by a group called Nonfiction Research, and it's called The Secret Financial Lives of Americans. I recommend that everybody read this because it's pretty disturbing, and it shows you where a lot of the problems of personal finance in America are. 
some of the disturbing statistics are about the number of people, you, you know, uh, 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 did you ever Bo, work for the man where you weren't working for yourself and working for somebody else? Uh, yeah, you know, I have, I have, and it was a very limited, limited time that I did Engagement? that. Yeah, yeah me like- too. Right. <laughs> but there was always that time when, when in the refrigerator, somebody was stealing lunches, right? I mean, I feel like every, every workplace in America has had lunches stolen. Well, this statistic, this report shows People are stealing lunches, not just to be a jerk and they like your ham sandwich. They are so broke, even though they have a job, they, they, they have no other way to eat. They are literally starving. And so they are stealing lunches just so that they have some food because they've messed up their money so bad. Or people that have said that they've eaten out of dumpsters or, or said that they would have sex for money. I mean, these are really disturbing, really hard statistics. But the one that was kind of the impetus of this book was of 330 some million Americans, nearly half of them say that they've cried about their money, nearly half. And you'd think those are people living paycheck to paycheck, and that's a little bit higher statistic, but this is the wild one of people making more than $200,000 or more a year, even with them, nearly half of those people crying about their money. So while we have all these great tools, all these phenomenal resources, we're still leaving half of America behind, right? So my book was made specifically as an on-ramp to all this other great stuff. So it, it is literally... I took the Hardy Boys detective manual that I read when I was in fourth grade, the Hardy Boys detective manual combined it with the Cub Scout Wolf Guide. And you have all these achievements and the easy achievements are in the front, the tough achievements are in the back and whatever you're dealing with when it comes to your money, just like I want to become a detective. If you want to become somebody who's really stacked, you just take the chapter you're working on, get that achievement and, uh, and then go on to the next one. So that is, that is what stacked is all about. The goal is to be kind of your primer for all this stuff, this foundation that we all need and seemingly don't have. You know, what's crazy. I mean, first of all, I congratulate you on the book. I will definitely, I'm not going to read it, but if you can upload it and have it on audible, I'll listen to it. Please. No, I got to tell you what's cool about the audio uh, audible version. Number one is people that know my show know it's live from my mom's basement and mom is in the book. She's got snarky stuff that she says, but she actually reads parts of it. But then uh, at the end of every chapter, we actually have an expert that we've interviewed in that area. So this is uh, I'm for people on YouTube or, or uh, that aren't on YouTube. Uh, Kristen Wong, I'm pointing to who talks about gamifying your money on our show. And we actually, instead of reading a transcript of it in the book on Audible, you actually hear the actual interviews uh, that we did. And Penguin Random House was nice enough to include those uh, in the audio book. So the audio book's pretty fun. Yeah, I I am. I I use Audible all the time. I'm going to get it today after this uh, interview here with you. And I will listen to it because First, I, I like to get the guest on and go, do I like this person? Uh, do, do I feel like I'm going to get something out of it? And then then it's like, it's now I, I already knew in two minutes, I'd, okay, this guy's cool. I like him. And um, I interviewed this guy recently, and he was talking about part of the brain. And um, I can't remember exactly how he said it, what the name of the part of the brain is, but we it's called your ancient brain, essentially. And it's the way... Anyways, we, we connected because of our ancient brains, basically, when we first, that's why we liked each other and like, okay, I believe this guy, he's going to be, and I would buy from you, right? And that's just happened. I already, I already said, oh, I'll buy from this guy. Like, if I didn't like you after the podcast interview, I would be like, no, I'm not. But anyways, yeah. I'll have to send you the link of the, this guy's pretty cool. You should get him on your show. I'd really liked him. He, he helps people do TED Talks and stuff now. And when I, I love that. To- we don't talk about that stuff enough, by the way. We don't talk about the brain connections. And I feel like just lately, maybe it's because of COVID, like people are talking about, you know, the lie that is the dopamine hit, you know, the dopamine hit when we buy something. But we can also, we can also, and this is a cool thing that I've learned recently, you can make that lie stronger where it's actually more effective. So the longer that you may already know this, Bo, but the longer that you delay that buying decision before you make it, when you make it, you'll get an even bigger dopamine hit. So even though dopamine is a liar, right? And that buying this thing doesn't give us this pleasure forever, you can make the hit even stronger. It's like, it's like doing a, doing a double, whatever your drink of choice is, you know, if you really want that hit and you're on Amazon, don't use the one click ordering, 
wait a week and every day think about how much you're going to like it and then buy it. And, you know, your wallet will thank you too. And maybe you don't buy it. And then that's a different hit serotonin, right? That's a whole different thing, but yeah, yeah. fascinating stuff. And that happens on Instagram when we're scrolling, scrolling through Instagram right now, it's become an addiction to so many people. I, I remember I grabbed my wife's phone and I looked, I looked at how long she was spending on Instagram in a day. And I was like, oh my God, this is ridiculous. But she's not alone. A lot of people are spending hours and hours on social media. But kind of circling back on what you're saying, I don't know the exact statistic, but it was based on hourly workers in the United States. And it was like, if an emergency happened and it would cost them $400, there was like, like, like 50% of that, that, working class hourly person couldn't afford a $400 uh, mistake and they didn't have yeah. it in their bank, you know? So the world is, is really messed up. I mean, it really is. And uh, I look at, you know, some of the downturns in the markets and, and I'm more in the real estate space, not so much yeah. the money management space, but I feel like it's great to interview people like yourself because I think it's good for people to have diversification and really know what's going on in different markets because all these markets kind of tie together, right? Yeah. What's your take right now? Like, um, do you think it's going to get bloody or is it, is it an over, over, overshot at this point? I and think I that, I think that, well, first of all, let, let me just address uh, uh, real estate specifically, my son owns 11 uh, rental properties. He's 26 years old. He's using the Burr method to purchase as many as he can, as quickly as he can. And it's, uh, it's, it's fascinating to watch him work. Um, you know, when it comes to like what we're trying to do, and this gets into whether I think it's bad or not, when inflation, you know, the consumer price index is over eight and a half percent. When it's that high, we have to beat eight and a half percent. And there's only two asset classes historically that have done that over long periods of time. And they both, by the way, get you to almost the same spot, which is the North American REIT index, the real estate index uh, averages about 10.2, 10.3 over long periods of time. So does the stock market. So those are the two things I think give you a prayer. Listen, if it's bloody right now and you've got a long-term goal, this is the best time to be out there. It's the best time to be hunting because as people are getting squeezed and you know that it, it's, it, it is funny because in the world of real estate, especially the idea of leverage get, creates more winners. It creates far more winners. However, look at 2007, 2008, it also flushes out losers more quickly, right? It does the same thing in the stock market just for whatever reason, we think leverage is normal with real estate. We don't for, for stocks. For stocks, it's taken out a margin loan on your positions, you know? And people are like, are you crazy? You're buying options, you know? Like, are you nuts doing that? That's risky. But, but in real estate, it's called a mortgage, right? And, and, and we all do it. Now, I don't want to pontificate on, on why one's considered risky and one isn't, but I think that we're going to see some people get squeezed by this recession. And when they do, I think, Bo, it's a phenomenal time, man. If you've got your war chest in place and you've built the foundation, this, this, this cash reserve, so that you're able to, uh, to go out there and grab these, I think we will see some deals. And if you're a long-term investor, I want to be there to, to mop that up. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. You got to be ready. You got to be ready. You always have to have a little bit of dry powder. You have to have available credit. You have to have good credit. Because um, at the end of the day, most of the time, unless you're using a private individual that's not running your credit, you need even these yeah. hard money funds that your son's using. And you can have your son call me. I help him burr. I'm the burr financing master. Yeah, um, absolutely. I, th and, I think you and him would get along great too, by and, the way. Yeah. And um, I'm sure he listens to bigger pockets and he likes that kind of stuff. And Scott, Scott Trench is his, uh, like, I feel like he's got like a picture of Scott Trench and he prays to him four or five times a day. He's a, he's, he's, he's a Scott Trench fanatic. Yeah. I, um, I know David Green very well and he's a great guy. And, uh, so anyways, yeah, it's a, it, it's amazing that podcast too. It's a, that podcast gets so many downloads, right? Like there's, there's yes. a lot of people and, and first of all, I want to say congrats to your son at 26 to have 11 doors or, or wherever he's at right now. Yeah. Um, and does he work too, or is this he all does. he's doing? Yes. He's an engineer at Microsoft. Oh, uh, yeah. 
but but you know it's great and, and by the way and that's that's helped fund it so he's kept his lifestyle really low right mm -hmm. so he he makes sure he has a lot of cash flow with his day-to-day -day life and then he um and then he uses the, the burr method in his feeling and and i've asked him i'm like so why are you on such a tear why are you doing this so quickly he's like i love my job but I know that I might not love it forever. And if I don't love it, I want this out, right? I want to build myself an out to do whatever the hell I want to do, which I think is great. Dad hasn't helped him with any of that, by the way, besides being a cheerleader and introducing him to David in the Burr Method. And, and um, he's also uh, done some mentorship with, with, uh, with, with Brandon. Um, so Turner, yeah. yes, yep. Done some good stuff. Yeah, Brandon's amazing. Uh, he's really blown up with his uh, with his fund. He started in his, you know, I think he has over a thousand investors. It's but exciting. So that's the power of podcasting too, right? He yeah. he was an OG in podcasting like you. And, you you know, over time, people resonate with you. They're going to follow you. And Brandon left bigger pockets. And now he has just running his big fund. And they're buying and you know what they say to, Yeah. And to your point, Bo, what they, I had a mentor tell me this a long time ago, and I just want to make sure we don't let this go. Cause I think it's really important for everybody is that over time you will attract people that are like you and you will repel people who aren't right. You'll just find your audience. So for people that are young and you're struggling to find, you know, your team you know, to, to, to find the people around you, you just, it's, it is to some degree, it's a numbers game because you just have to keep going out to coffees, meeting people, making phone calls until you find your group of people that, that really are going to get where you're headed. And, and that goes back to, um, John, his name is John Bates, who I interviewed, like that all comes to your ancient brain. It's like you meet uh, somebody and usually in the uh, first 30 seconds, you know if you're going to like them or not. And it's subliminal and um, subconsciously you're making that decision. And so have you ever had a salesperson like call you and you knew like right off the bat, like anything they said, you still wouldn't buy from them. <laughs> right, it's, yes. it's, it's, and then there and then it's vice versa that some Somebody comes up to you and, and you're like, I'm buying whatever that person's selling. And it's yeah. so true. So it's like figuring out all this stuff in life is very cool. And uh, that's why I love interviewing people because it's like you you learn a lot from everybody. And and uh, it's like uh, I, I actually didn't go to college. I, I, um, I just wasn't into college. I, and I tried to go to junior college and like I was like, okay, what can I do? I either wanted to be in law enforcement or um, be in real estate. And I got in real estate at the age of 20 fantastic uh, yeah yeah because college is not for everybody and definitely wasn't for me but i can tell you what i went to i went to like thousands and thousands of hours of courses on real estate investing on on lending i mean i have such a good phd in you know real estate now because of that and so i i think early on we got to teach money management to people like to everybody across the board because well, yeah. i didn't have any of that yeah, and I know we're jumping around a little bit, but I have to say that this that this is, um, and we actually do talk about this in my book, and we talk about it on our podcast a lot. That there's there's these things that um, I was lucky enough to work with one of the top financial planners in the United States, and he called the goals of retirement, traditional retirement, and helping kids with college as kind of the Puritan ethic goals. We've been spoon fed this garbage forever. And because of that, we think that's what we have to do. Like when we're, okay, I got to go to college. I have to go to college. And, and the answer is to your point, Bo, like why? And if you can't answer that why, it's much more about designing a curriculum for yourself. I mean, look at these people that are, that are, that are welders. I mean, they get this phenomenal education, but they're being paid while they're an apprentice, right? You're, you're an apprentice working in the trades, you're being paid and you're learning at the same time. Like, so I think it's much more to your point about creating your PhD level curriculum. It's much more about creating a curriculum than it is about checking the box that, yes, I went to this school and did something that, you know, half of it didn't resonate with me or three quarters didn't resonate with me. You know, like part of my problem with some financial advisors is like they are so focused on, you know, what they want to sell, right? Or what they want to advise. Like, and they don't talk about alternative stuff like, you know, a solo 401k because they're not going to get that. They're not going to get any fee income from that. And so I think really we need the diversification. There needs to be, uh, I think there should be a financial planner that encompasses real estate, you know, investing sure. in REITs, like the full gamut, right? Give, give people 
the options in the education where they know they can diversify their their money not you know so i think it's like there's wall street and then there's alternative and like there's no in between and it would be nice to see more of a, a blended approach and i think that's why you have yep. your podcast because there's a need for this conversation to happen because i don't know your space that well and it yeah. would benefit me to understand the stock market better to understand how money moves in in that world yeah, well, and actually, a good financial planner, their job is to start with their job is to start with you and what you're trying to do and to maximize your strengths and to minimize your weaknesses. So a great advisor is going to help you lead with whatever it is that you're great at. So somebody telling my son, as an example, stop buying real estate and pop money in the stock market, he should fire them. I mean, he shouldn't even hire them, right? And, and second, anybody that leads with, and a good friend of mine, a guy named Roger Whitney said this first, So, but, but I love it and I parrot it all the time. And I think, Bo, you'll like this too. Anybody who leads with product and not process you should run from that person. It needs to start with process. What's our decision-making process and how do we make better decisions? But if they come up and go, dude, I got an annuity, it's gonna solve all your problems. Like that, that that's a salesperson. We don't want anything to do with the salesperson. I mean, it's the same with, with some of the syndicate people out there, right? I mean, we've had some of these people peddling real estate garbage. And by the way, I'm not saying all syndicate people right. are, are peddling garbage, but you and I have seen it in the space. These people are peddling garbage and all you do is a little bit of research and you know that it's garbage. Um, but if somebody leads with that, then you're talking to a salesperson and not talking to somebody who really you want on your team. Because ultimately, ultimately what you're looking for are people that can help cover your blind spots so that you can spend time on the stuff that really makes you money, which is your unique talent. If your unique talent is real estate, then you should be flexing that. And I'll give you, by the way, because I've been in a crap load of financial planning offices. Let me give everybody a clue to a bad financial advisor. And you can, you'll, you'll know it's a bad financial advisor before you even talk to them. If you go into their office, let's say you're meeting face to face. If you go into their office and they have like Jim Cramer or Fox business or whatever the stock market du jour thing is, that's a crappy financial advice. So they have it on the TV. If all of the stuff is about stock trading or is about whatever, it, 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 they're garbage. They want to be a stock jock. You don't want a stock jock. Even if you're in the stock market, you don't want a stock jock in your corner. You want somebody who's going to help you make better decisions. So I like it if it's like Travel and Leisure Magazine, right? Or Rick Steves of the travel channels on there and all these dreams, stuff that about dreams and dreaming bigger or thinking bigger, or even like a Tony Robbins thing or something about, you know, we can do more. Like that's what that's historically the people that have that in their reception area are better advisors. Then the second thing, and you get this, if you call them, if you call them or you go to their website, if their website's crap, they're crap. Uh, but also if they, if you call them and the receptionist, if he or she seems disgruntled at all and doesn't have the time of day for you, I'll tell you, Bo, these, these offices are really small. All of that comes from the top. I have never been in an office where the reception is disgruntled and the advisor is a phenomenal person. The reception is disgruntled because they got to work with this jerk all day, every day. And it turns out you're going to be the next person on the receiving end of whoever this is. So look, look out for those things. Also, the, if the, but you know, I don't want the office to look like a bajillion dollars because I don't want my money going toward, you know, uh, uh, this beautiful, whatever it is, this palace that they've created for themselves. But by the same token, I also don't want to be served. And I remember this one advisor had these little tiny like styrofoam cups to serve like little mini coffees in. And, and they weren't even, you know, they were, it wasn't a cappuccino or something. that's just a little hit in espresso. It wasn't that. It was literally like a mini little coffee, like he was rationing coffee. If this dude is so cheap that he's rationing coffee, imagine how he's thinking about your goals, you know? So there's all these little hints that you can get about whether somebody's going to, going to be helpful or not. My dad's actually a financial advisor. And, um, what I, what, what <laughs> and I, he serves many coffees probably no, he, as a disgruntled receptionist. He doesn't, he, he's like, <laughs> he's an old timer now. I mean, he's, uh, turning, he's still in the business. He's turning 70, but he, he doesn't have a ton of clients, but he has pretty good clients they're sizable you know 
They're not the yeah. entry. So he, you know, he, he works part time, I would say. He loves what he does. Um, but well, what I enjoyed was whenever there was an event, like, you know, these REITs that want my dad to sell things, uh, sell these REITs or these shares of these REITs or whatever, they always had these huge dinners. And I, my dad always gave me a ticket. So I'd always get these like steak and lobster dinners. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I loved it. I love that. We used to. So it's pretty, it's a pretty interesting industry. And my brother actually um, works for a very large, well, I think the largest mutual fund company in the world. Um, and he's a big wholesaler. So those guys were in the kind of the financial services. And I was like, the, my brother has an economics degree. And, and so he's always been really good with his money. Like he was, I was always more entrepreneurial. He was like, yeah. he saw, like my parents had us at a very young age and, and um, like they were like 20 years old when they had my brother, you know, it's, and I couldn't imagine I'm 42. I don't have any kids. I just got married. At four, uh, no, I'm, excuse me. I'm not 42. I'm 44. I just well, got married at 42 years old. I want to stay at 42 as well. <laughs> Let's do that. Yes. But it's interesting to see this whole, so <clears throat> So I love the concept of your book. I, I'm like I said, I'm going to get it on Audible. Um, how often do you guys do your podcast? Is this a weekly show? To, how when does it come out? So we are three days a week. Wherever Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we call it the greatest money show on earth, which sounds like we're bragging until you realize we call it that because it's a circus. The goal is to have a lot of segments. We have a headline segment at the beginning. Then we have a featured interview, which usually isn't a financial person. It's somebody financially adjacent. So we talked to the CEO of uh, Cirque du Soleil was one of my favorites. Uh, he's talking about dreaming bigger, about thinking bigger about your, your life. And what's interesting, by the way, about his interview too, when he got the job, he's in a suit and tie because he's going to be the CEO and they're getting ready to introduce him. And the the creator of Cirque du Soleil is appalled that he's wearing a suit and tie, because if you are representing the circus of his, you shouldn't be in a suit and tie. So they literally take take a pair of scissors and they cut his tie. So it's just like a, a half tie that's clearly been cut with scissors and they make him get rid of his jacket and do some, you know, come out much more casual and represent who he really is. And he was still too buttoned up because he'd been a CEO of a couple of companies before this. And so the creator, hired a clown to follow him into all the board meetings and to and to to make him realize that you know what if we if we spend a little more time dreaming and lightening it up like it allows us to get more serious about the things we need to get serious on and forget all the garbage like a lot of a lot of places are serious about a bunch of stuff that's garbage so that was interesting um another you know we talked to people that mark randolph who is the uh, co-creator of netflix not doing that well now but the way that they created that company was incredible and then other times people of mindset like you're talking about so we try to make it so that while our interviews are um are tangentially about money they're much more about creating a better life for yourself then we'll answer a listener question at the end and um call it a day but the shows are 60 to 70 minutes long and three days a week you're listening to the investor financing podcast we'll be right back after this break. Hello, Bo Eckstein here, host of the Investor Financing Podcast. Are you a lender, real estate professional, or vendor that provides products or services within the real estate investing and business owner space? We are offering a few sponsorship opportunities to get in front of a highly targeted audience. If you're interested, please click the link below for further information. We look forward to talking with you. Thanks, make it a great day. I think my biggest problem, and I think this is a lot of people, it's like just doing simple things. It sounds stupid, but it's true. Like paying myself first. Like when I get a commission check, like how easy is it just to like write a check or have an automatic debit drafts? Hey, I'm going to take 20% of every check that comes in. If I would have been doing that over the last 20 years, I would be living in a castle right now <laughs> right. instead of a you know a, a decent house but it's like the simple thing so at 44 years old i'm saying let's just start doing these simple things like first of all i was just calculating i have like 15 1800 dollars a month in wasted like apps and software i'm not even using that just debiting out of my account yeah what if i just cut them off and took that 1800 dollars 
or let's call it two grand. That's $24,000 extra that I'm wasting right now. That could be in a, something that's compounding and the next duplex or whatever. So these money habits that I never have. And um, that's where I give credit to my brother because he's always been really good with his money. And I am just like entrepreneurial, but I'm also ADD. And I'm like, okay, like, you know, so it's just simple things like that. What, what have you found useful for like creating simple hacks to like just start doing simple things that are gonna, you know, in five, 10 years are gonna be an extra six figures laying somewhere? Six, oh, seven. absolutely. Well, it, well, we could even make it smaller than that. Let's make it smaller instead of bigger to show you how powerful this is. The key isn't making good financial moves. You're going to stumble upon good financial moves a few times a year. We're like, man, that's a win. You know, I, I mean, how many times have we have we made some move and uh, and went that was great. But then we don't follow through with it. So I'll give you an example. I'll give you a small example to show you how powerful this is. Let's say that you change your cell phone provider and you save 50 bucks a month. Right. You, what happens with most of us? We save 50 bucks, we high five ourselves, And then the next month we forgot that we saved the 50 bucks and now we're going out to dinner another night or we're you know, doing something else new and the money just disappears. So it actually has to be a one, two punch. It's serendipity that we found the 50 bucks and we took that half an hour to do it. But then we have to lock it in. And the way we lock it in is automation. Don't expect yourself to be a brainiac when it comes to your money lock it in so you don't have to be at all. You can do this in a really lazy way and here's how. Take that 50 bucks the second you discover it and immediately set up from your bank account or your paycheck if you work you know, someplace that goes into a separate savings account and a mutual fund into something. Just save it into something so it disappears. It was disappearing already going to Verizon. <laughs> now have it disappear going to you. And once you do that 50 bucks, that's six hundred dollars a year. Doesn't sound like much, but in a decade, that's six thousand bucks. Now, for me, I just got back from a vacation. It cost me about three grand. It was a really nice vacation. That is, and no matter what we do, we need this time away. We need this. We need this time to reset our brain and to get above the clouds and go. What am I really trying to achieve here? What's my What's my goal? If you told me that just by one fifty dollar move, I could take two extra vacations a decade on top of what I'm doing. It's phenomenal. Like it's fantastic, an extra vacation. So, but, but then multiply that, but with what you're saying, you know, you lock in these decisions that are a thousand, two thousand dollars a month and holy crap, you're right. And, and now you've, now you're, you've got more doors. Now you're moving faster. Now you're, yeah, you're, you're rocking even more. So uh, I love the idea of lock it in and automate it. And the reason we do that is to recognize that we're not special and that we're busy. If I know I'm not special and I know that I'm busy and I know that there's no way in hell with my ADD, I'm gonna remember any of this, I gotta go, damn, I say 50 bucks, lock it in right now, add that to that uh, automatic deposit so that it disappears. And by the way, once the money disappears, you seriously don't, <laughs> you just, you, yeah. you never miss it. When I was a financial planner, one more thing on this, when I was a financial planner, Somebody would say, you know what? I don't think I can save any money. I'm like, okay, let's do an experiment. Let's just try to save 50 bucks a month. And they're like, oh man, I don't know if I can do that. Okay, let's do this. We're going to put in a savings account at your bank. So if you end up needing it, you can get it. I don't want it to have an ATM access though. I want it to be a place where you have to literally go through a little pain to get it. But if you need it, we can do one of two things. We can go to the bank and get it. Or number two, we can just shut off the automatic deposit anytime you want. You know, let's just try it. You know, the number of times over 16 years, somebody came back to me and said, dude, I couldn't do that. Like, like, it, oh, that, that was rough. Never, like not one. And so if we just force ourselves to push that gas pedal a little harder, well, we always find a way. Like we totally always find a way. And what's that? The I don't know if it's a theory or what, but when, when, when I was younger and I was living, I, I would, in my early 20s, I was doing well, but, you know, it was always a page, I was a commission based. So I'd, I'd get a big commission and I'd go party and, and then my bank account would be depressed. And, um, but if you're able to have these reserves, there's a level of comfort that comes into your life knowing, oh, I have six or 12 months of reserves. You're not in, if, especially if you're in sales and you got that frantic lifestyle, like, and you're yes. always like that hunter gatherer, hunter gatherer, hunter. Ga and I felt that yeah. for like the, like basically most of my career. And once I was able to put 
12 months of reserves away. It's like, I'm so much more at peace. And yes. I could just, and what, uh, it, what resonates with me is what you were saying earlier about how many people even making two and 300 grand a year, if you live in the Bay Area making 200 grand a year, you're still eating mac and cheese, you know? It's like, <laughs> so so it, it's like, you, you gotta get off the hamster wheel, right? Like, and, and I think your life is, my uh, just let me give you an example. My wife is from Mexico. I met her in Mexico, but um, their their culture is more family oriented than ours. They're not so driven like us. I would say all in all, like they're more relaxed. I guess not driven is not a good word. They're more at peace being poor, right? Versus like the Americans. Like to them, they're not poor, right? To, to us, they would be poor, <laughs> and. Um, but they're more at peace. And I think by having six or 12 months of reserves, you're going to be more at peace in life and you're going to enjoy your life more. You're going to be able to like think better and you're going to work on your business, not in your business. And so it's these steps we're talking about, about automating. And you're right. Like I was going to, so I opened another bank account. Sorry. I opened another bank account at, at Navy federal credit union. I, I, all, I bank. <laughs> That's our all. main sponsor. That's oh. the main sponsor of our podcast. Yeah. So, uh, First of all, Navy Federal, thumbs up. But I opened I opened a a a new bank account there, and I don't I don't go there. I can just deposit the check online. So like yes, the other day I got like two small checks. It was like three thousand dollars. So you know, ten. I gotta I have to write the check. It would be better if I didn't even think about it. every. Like I need to figure a way of doing it. I don't want it at Wells Fargo because I have like eight or nine Wells Fargo and they're all linked to my bank account. Or yeah, maybe. yeah. So I don't want to be able to see it. I just want to like <laughs> forget about it. And like over years, it just grows. But we should all be doing this stuff. And we, yeah. should, we should make it a game. Well, well, let me tell you two more things you stumbled upon with that, uh, with having that emergency fund. Because the ROI and emergency fund, and I get a lot of pushback, by the way, in the emergency fund, because with inflation over eight and a half percent, Bo, and an emergency fund, you know, Wells Fargo, wherever, paying half a percent less than that. A lot of people are like, a lot of the money geniuses are, are like, dude, I'm making, I'm losing money. I'm losing purchasing power by putting that money there. But it's not only, that's not your only ROI is that peace of mind. If you are a commission salesperson, here's the problem I always had with my, with my clients that were commission salespeople was that it would be, it would be ramen noodle, ramen noodle, ramen noodle, big steak dinner when I got paid or big screen TV, first payment on big screen TV, whatever it is, you get these massive paychecks and you live the life of the rich and famous for four days until you blow it all. And then you're back to mac and cheese again. So we had to get rid of that. And the way we did it was once you build that emergency fund, figure out an aggregate, how much money you think you're going to make in a year, take a little bit off the top, just in case you don't, and then start paying yourself the same amount every two weeks. So you have these two different checking accounts. You got the one where the commissions are coming in and then it's bleeding out. But the amount of money you're living on is a consistent paycheck because that gives you that peace of mind you're talking about. And now I'm living kind of this W-2 lifestyle where my, you know, I can live the same all the time. And now twice a year, once a year, I'll give myself a quote bonus check if I make extra money. I will reward myself with this big, huge, huge check, which is a bonus. That's number one. Number two is, the return on investment also besides peace of mind to having that money in that in that that emergency fund or that cash reserve is that you can do something else which i talk about when i talk about insurances insurance companies want you to talk about whether you need the insurance or not you don't want to have that discussion the discussion you want to have is what are my risks and how do I protect them and once you start thinking about that bigger topic versus do i need the insurance you start making better insurance decisions which means if you've got six months worth of money in a savings account, that short-term disability policy you're paying for that's super expensive, you might not need it. Don't get me wrong. If, you, if you're really conservative, you might want to keep it. But that stuff is really expensive. And now you can self-insure. And that saves you a bunch of money that you were paying in premiums. You talk about saving money in subscriptions. This is a you know a, a insurance subscription. Your, your homeowner's policy, if you own your house, of course, you've got that deductible. If you don't have any money in savings, you probably want a low deductible. But once you have that money in savings, you can raise the deductible. And sure, that money at Wells Fargo is only earning, you know, a half a percent or whatever the small amount it is. 
now your rate of return is the insurance company is charging you less on insurance. And so your homeowners, maybe your car insurance, you can go through and you can look at these policies that you don't need and you can start eliminating them because of the fact that you have this money in the bank. So there's multiple, there's peace of mind. Number two is if you have a jagged income stream, you can even it out so it's easier to budget. And then number three is you can start eliminating insurance policies, which saves you a crap load of money. Yeah, I love it. And, and listen, I just squeezed out all this mo- savings that was going to some other company. Now I'm keeping the, more money. Yeah. And I just, I just, ta- I just take that extra two grand I just saved by going through all of my bills, by getting rid of the things I don't need. That two grand goes into an account. Over time, it grows, and then maybe at the end of the year, I have twenty five thousand. I go buy a duplex, and that's my down payment. Now I'm Bam. getting. Now I got six hundred, eight hundred dollars a month of cash flow coming in. I got appreciation, depreciate, appreciation, depreciation, and mortgage pay down, or whatever. Or maybe I, you know, dabble in the stock market. <laughs> no, think I'm not going to. These, well, think about the very least all these extra doors per year that you're buying. You're already on a pace to buy X number a year. If you can add a couple more per year, like how how great is that? Like the compounding interest on building your net worth is so powerful. Like that, just these little moves. Yeah, just think about your son. He stays at Microsoft for the next five years, and uh, there's a downturn. He he's now has equity. He just during the downturn he picks up an extra twenty properties. So over the next five years, now he has he has like at some point he's going to have sixty doors, and he's going to go. You know what? I'm getting. Now I have all these doors. I'm going to 1031 exchange. I'm going to go buy it, like a couple big apartments. And then now he's ready to quit working for Microsoft when he wants to. I think too many people rush into quitting their job. They're, everybody right now in our world, and I get it. Everybody doesn't want a job, right? We all want to be solopreneurs. We want to be living on the beach. But the fact of the matter is, is that you got to put work in one way or the other. I've been an entrepreneur all my life and I work probably work 10 times harder than most W2 employees. And it's not, you know, it, it takes a long time and, and I, I'm not one of the lucky ones that hits a gold mine right off the bat. I have to put serious work in every day. And so a lot of people that are quitting their jobs too early without having the right reserves, I think that's a mistake. Well, and I see people, the beach lifestyle is overrated, frankly. And don't get me wrong. I, I, I love being on the beach but I don't know a person I've seen that retired early to that lifestyle that wasn't bored within a year. I think, I think a a better path. um, And I don't want to be judgy about that. Maybe there's somebody out there that that, that could live the beach lifestyle forever, Bo, but I think a better path and a healthier path is to get right with the fact that one of the, one of the most fun things you can ever do is serve other people and help them get what they want. And it is super fun doing that. And, and, you know, there's that old, mantra that if you help other people get what they want, you always get what you want. And, you know, you think about somebody, I remember when my son started on this journey, most of his houses are in Detroit and uh, we're from Detroit originally. And you're looking at a rebirth in that city. That's pretty damned exciting. And these contractors he's working with Detroit were telling him they're like the number of jobs he's providing the rebeautification of this beautiful city. Like my son gets off on the fact that he is helping this city's rebirth and he's re reasserting some of these gorgeous houses that were just trash. Here's how trash one of his houses were. This is, this is awesome. So he buys this house, right? And there's the lawn in the backyard is super duper high. The, the, I mean, there's weeds that, that come up to your head. He, he hires a long guy to go out there and, and clean it up. The long guy in the back of the yard, in the far back of the yard, finds a Pontiac Grand Am that nobody knew was there. That's crazy. <laughs> and, that, and now he's got to figure out because it's abandoned property. Like it becomes this whole other thing. Like, how do I get rid of a tra- or a Grand Am that's not mine? Like, how do I, like, what, how does that? And so we had to go into how that whole process works, which is a whole different podcast. But anyway, uh, uh, he really gets excited about the fact that he's helping people live in beautiful houses, restoring these houses, and he's making money at the same time. Like, I think that's a much healthier lifestyle. Than, than wanting to go be on a beach, you know? Yeah, I, I need to be learning. I, my, like, I, enjoy, I couldn't tell. I, I, I can't tell that about you at all. I, I, I would like, when I was single, every weekend I would be at a conference. Like for like eight years straight, I was going to all these conferences. I loved it. I'd 
because I'm a people person. Go meet like cool people. And I resonated with people that were entrepreneurial that, that, you know, were at least trying to be entrepreneurial or a very high level. And uh, it just, I haven't been doing it because of, you know, obviously COVID. The one time I went to a conference, so I haven't had COVID, right? I go to this conference here. I live in Las Vegas, by the way. I, I, I went to um, Grow With Video. It was a, about blowing up your YouTube and doing video. Really cool. Um, we had Gary Vaynerchuk speak, um, Alex Hermosi, all these really cool influencers that are pretty smart. Um, and I got COVID at the event. And that was the first time I got COVID. And granted, I go to the gym every single day and I never got COVID. Go to one event. The first event I went to, got sick. It's And Vegas is the worst because you get people flying in from everywhere. But luckily for me, I was only sick for like five days. So just before bad. just before uh, everything shut down, four or five days before that, I was at a conference called PodFest. And miraculous, I was shaking hands. I was probably, you know, should have been. This is back before masks, and everybody was saying that if you just wash your hands a lot, you're going to be good. And I still would inadvertently, because you just do it. You just shake hands, and I'm like, oh crap, I'm shaking hands, and I shouldn't be doing that. And anyway, I didn't get COVID. Miraculously, hardly anybody got COVID at that. I don't think anybody got COVID at that event. I just went again three weeks ago, and everybody got COVID. <laughs> Like everybody, I felt it was safe. It's my first conference back and everybody got COVID. I got, I got it. It was, was, pod, it was, was, was there a lot of real estate pod, uh, like a lot of real estate podcasters there? I'm there, was to a fa- there was a fair number. It's in Orlando. Yeah. It's really a, a nice uh, indie influencer podcast or excuse yeah. me, indie influencer event, indie podcaster event, uh, Orlando every year in the spring. Yeah, nice I guy. Think- Chris Kermitsos runs it. Good, cool guy. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, that's interesting. Well, Joe, I don't want, we've already, I told you 20 minutes. This has already been an hour. So, of course. Of course. <laughs> but everybody, I hope you enjoy this, this conversation. So you can see if you listen to Joe's podcast, that it's going to be a lot more enjoyable than some stuffy guy talking about the bond market, talking about this. He makes learning and uh, learning about man- financial planning management and money topics. He interviews guests on different array of things. So, um, I could tell your show is amazing. I, I've listened to it actually before you came on the show. I was listening to a few of your episodes to get a get a feel of what you were all about. And um, I was on your website, and you have a really great website too. I know you guys put a lot of time and thought into it. It's cool because you're you're really you. you're really um, your strength and your superpower really was was always branding, right? I mean, you love financial planning and management um, to a certain degree, but really, you really love building brand it seems like your whole career. I like that I just like the creativity of making something that I can be proud of I like the creativity of the show like I know a lot of other personal finance shows are really into you know giving tips and and um, uh, uh, sharing wisdom don't get me wrong I want to share wisdom but I want to be able to do it in a way that we attract some of those people crying about their money like that is what I'm proud of so I I really get excited about on today's episode we talk about, um, you know, 2007, 2008 in the stock market. If you remember the movie, The Big Short, those guys were at a strip club and there's a stripper who, who um, goes, <laughs> goes by the name on Twitter. She's reverse cowgirl 69. <laughs> and she says she can predict where the stock market's going before bankers can. And um, just this idea that there's these leading indicators that you wouldn't think of. Like I had clients that would that were veterinarians, and people don't take their pets to the to the vet as often when we go into an economic downturn. And they they were always like, if you talked to my veterinarian clients, you could tell how bad the recession was going to be because of the fact that. So anyway, we talk about strip clubs and veterinarians to help you with your money. Well, that you're was well, in, you're well, welcome. Well, we knew in 2005 and six when, um, you know, I w- when I was doing residential mortgages, now I just do all commercial and, and investor type of loans, but I would do these loans. And back then it was stated income. Like you could, Oh, what do you do for a living? I'm an inter- entertainer. Okay. <laughs> like, you know, they have five or six houses here in Las Vegas. It's just like, Oh my God. Uh, you're a garbage man, so we're going to put sanitation technician on I your know. application. At least, oh no, this is how bad it got. Even in my even in my universe, and I know we're running long, but get this: a dude I worked with, a dude I worked with, uh, and none of this stuff can happen anymore. But this is how surreal it was. Everybody was that. Uh, uh, so the appraiser comes; he's refinancing his house. The appraiser comes 
and he's got a six pack of beer sitting next to him or a, or a, or a case of beer. And, uh, and he goes, man, it sure is hot to, out today because the appraiser's coming up to the door. And he says, and he says, uh, the appraiser goes, yeah, this sure is hot. He goes, hey, you know, I've got some beers here. I got some beers here. And, uh, and you know, if you want one. And the guy goes, well, I really can't take beer. He goes, he goes, he goes, but what price did you pay for that beer? He goes, $455,000. I paid for this beer. The guy <laughs> goes, got it. Thank you. And the beer disappeared. And, and believe it or not, the appraisal come in at four hundred and fifty five thousand dollars. Amazing. Amazing. You know, there's there's always back then, th back then they didn't have those AMCs. They didn't have the appraisal management company. So yeah. back in the old days, the loan officer would just call up their appraiser friend and go, hey, um, I'm doing a loan for uh, this person. They live over in, uh, you know, X, Y, Z in San Francisco. What do you think you can get that thing they're appraised for? You know what I mean? Like it was, <laughs> it, you're just like it, it was kind of. Oh, and um, yeah, yeah, like World Savings had these like loans, the NEGAM loans. And it's like oh. you got a 1% start rate. You're fully index rate 7%, but you only have to pay at 1%. That's an awesome deal. So you could really afford this million dollar house on your on your $4,000 a month salary. Um, but but yeah, it's going to be um, at least this time around that uh, the lending environment is a lot more uh, c controlled and uh, yeah. I don't yeah. think we'll have nearly the same problem, um, but we will see some interesting things. There's a lot of these I buyers that go and buy houses now, right? They, they're like these big institutional funds, and, and they're. I was reading something like they had like three billion dollars allocated last year or something. These funds in the buying up certain places in Arizona and Texas and. And this year they were supposed to have about 50 billion between these these funds to buy these single fam family houses but i was on facebook and one of my friends actually like he basically gets deals and sells them to these funds that's what it does for a living yeah you know like that's a pretty hot commodity and and, and yesterday he said he said one of the major uh home buyers stopped buying across the board so they're not buying anywhere oh. right now so that's kind of a did you that, see did you yeah. see though Goldman just bought a whole neighborhood? Uh, no, but I believe it. Yeah. Yeah. The build to rent, that's a very like build to rent. So now these builders are building single family homes and instead of selling them, they keep them. Build to rent, we call it. So whole. Yeah. We have we, we design lending products to do this now. So the world's changing so fast. The Ubers, the Airbnbs, technology can move things so quickly. So it'll be interesting, kind of like you know, to kind of play out. I, in 2007, I didn't understand that the markets sometimes crash. I always thought real estate went up and I made a big mistake in my 20s and didn't realize, you know, there wasn't the podcast out there educating us stupid kids. <laughs> and it was, I was a mortgage broker, right? So I'd write my loans. I'd go, oh, I could buy this house with nothing down. I buy this house with nothing down. It was easy. And, yeah. then, the, and then the music stopped and I go, oopsie daisy. So many people, my, my sister and brother-in-law lost their lost their house. There were just so many, so many people that, 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 you know, I mean, good people making what looked like all the right moves and who knew then, but you're right. They didn't have you, Bo. They didn't yeah. have you then. Yeah. And it's all about educating. That's why guys, that's the beauty of this world right now is that we have people like you, me and the podcast of the world that are good. Some of them suck, but <laughs> that, that like people are just, they're bringing on great guests to share information this is the new way to be social in a way like this is the way I meet people I would never meet. I'd never meet you right now. We're buddies. And it was just through a podcast. So that's another cool thing about podcasting. So anybody out there that has a good message, I would say, you know, if you have something to talk about and you're good and you can learn how to interview people and uh, you don't know how to be perfect. You just got to press record. That's my yeah. philosophy. But yep. Joe, it's been such a pleasure. I feel like I know you now and, and um, I'm going to get your book on Audible. I'm going to write you a five-star review, only if it's Thank good. You. But I won't, good. I, I won't lie to the people, but no I'll, I'll yeah. give it some honest feedback. And I hope everybody enjoyed this show. We talked about a lot of things, not only just real estate, but just simple things to make your life better and then get to the point where you can give and serve to others, right? You get to a point in your life where you have gotten served by other people. Now you're ready to serve people. I think if we could do that on a big level, the world would be a better place. Amen, brother. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you on the next episode.